also, I gave you all some of my testimony on why I wrote the book called Out. Okay, why I wrote the book called Out. And our special guest today is someone who has aided this moment, who has been a great help to this moment. Literally, this, this right here tonight is a full circle moment for me. It is a full circle moment for me. So come on in, tell a friend to tell a friend that we are here and we are live at Called Out Live. That we are here and called out live for anybody. For anybody who is already in the chat, give me a wave. Give me a wave so that I know you are here. A, a wave of hands emoji. So that I know you are here with me. Before I introduce my special guest, I want to know that somebody is here. Okay, somebody said, hey, y'all. That is good enough. Hey, Auntie Michi. My Auntie Michi is here. Hi. Hi, Brianna. Hi, Tarot. Hi, Alina. Okay, y'all is in here. All right, y'all, without further ado, I'm about to bring up my special guest for tonight for Called Out Live. This is the very first special guest of Called Out Live, and I am excited because, as I told y'all, this is a full circle moment. Um, when I decided, well, first of all, if I could just take it back to 2020, when I was having, like, the hardest time of my life, this man of God was who I found to help me, help get me out of the pit. He is literally the reason why I knew Delta Sigma Theta was no longer a thing for me and why I had to leave. So without further ado, I want to welcome to the stage, Pastor Kevin L.A. Uwe. Hey, hey, how you doing, Pasha? <laughs> Hi. Give me some clap hand emojis, y'all, in the chat for him. <laughs> Give me some mm -hmm. clap hand emojis in the chat for him. Mm -hmm. Y'all, I am thoroughly excited about this. Um, so Minister Kevin, I, I wanna I wanna show you something. Mm -hmm. Right ahead. <laughs> so uh if I could just tell the story briefly, right I ahead. first <laughs> I I was I was having a situation. So y'all know when 2020 happened. The world shut down. And when the world shut down, it was like all I could do was seek the Lord. It was like all I had. I'm like, I don't know what to do because, you know, I'm a social butterfly. So for me to not be around people, it like hurt me so much. And I'm just like, OK, well, let me just tune in with the Lord. And I decided to go on a fast and I went on a 21 day fast with just water, I believe. I think I was drinking water and apple juice. And um, during that fast, my dreams went wild. They went wild. And one day I was just like, you know what? I can't be out here Googling these dreams because there's some crazy stuff going on over there on Google. So I go to YouTube and I start typing in like ministers talking about dreams and stuff like that. And that is where I found Minister Kevin Ewing. That is where I found him. And my God, I think the first thing I watched was like a title called Spiritual Implication of Dreams. And then I went down a rabbit hole of all of his teachings. Even when I was thinking that I was fasting right, I went and watched Fasting the Game Changer. And I actually have it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have my notes. This is my notebook from May of 2020 or from all of 2020. But I wanted to show you that I literally, when I found you, I was taking notes on every single thing. And this right here, let me show you. Fast in the game changer. I don't know mm -hmm. if you can see it, but mm -hmm. it literally says May 2020, May 5th, 2020. Fast in the game changer. And I have so like pages of notes from that video. And I was just like, man, this guy. <laughs> and then the next one was May 19th, 2020. I don't know if you could see that. 
May 19, 2020 is when I took notes on a teaching that you did about covenants. And that's what brings us here tonight, y'all. Because when I learned about, um, when I was listening to his teaching, it was very interesting. And he talked a lot about secret societies being the reason why you may be going through things in life that you don't necessarily know what is actually happening, right? And so when he said that, I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Because he, he only mentioned in that video, Freemasonry and some stars, stuff like that. And so I end up scrolling down in the comments and somebody asked, are you talking about black Greek letter organizations too? And he said, yes. He didn't even say like no other explanation. He just said, yes, like why yes. And when he said that, I was just like, I oh, know he lied. <laughs> But I went and looked it up and my God, I just did my own due diligence of research. And I was just like, oh, okay, I can see why this could be wrong. You know, like, you know, Delta, Minerva, all of that. Okay, I can see why this would be wrong. So what I did was I renounced the oath and the pledge like that, that night. I was on my fast and during that fast, I renounced the oath and the pledge. And I was just like, okay, I renounced those vows. It's fine. I'm moving on with my life. My dreams got wilder. They did not stop. I was still being attacked. And then it wasn't until I saw you go live with Dr. Alexis. And on that live, you were talking about, um, I would think, rules of engagement. And somebody asked in the comments, when you got to Covenant, somebody asked in the comments, like, are you talking about, you know, Greek letter organizations as well? And you were like, yes. And you and Dr. Alexis went on to explain it. And then was just like, it was some deltas in the comments going crazy, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about how you, what you were saying wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And after that, after that live, you gave me a lot of insight. And it was at that moment I renounced fully and got rid of all my paraphernalia, everything. Because before then, I would just renounce the stuff that I said. But after that, I got rid of everything completely. And that led me to God, like, telling me to do a video about it two years later. I did the video and to everybody who sent him my video, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Cause that's how we're here. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's right. how we are here for every single person who sent him my video. Thank you so much. I really appreciate y'all because my God, I would have never guessed this. I've been watching this man for four years. I would have never guessed that God would bring me to alive with you and do a teaching live. This is like amazing. It's full circle. And before I get emotional, we about to jump right in. <laughs> we are going to jump right in before I get emotional. Okay, so tonight we are talking all things understanding illegal covenants and altars. And y'all know anybody who is here from um, Minister Kevin's page, y'all already know what's up. Y'all know he got a lot of meat to give. So for my first question, I want to ask you kind of like a three in one, if you don't mind. Right so it's what is a covenant? How do we make covenants? And what categorizes a covenant to be illegal to God? Okay, very good question. First of all, Portia, thank you once again for having me as the first guest on your show. I feel yes, very I'm highly excited. honored. <laughs> And uh, as usual, I'm always happy to come in and share the truth. I will start off by saying this. You know, the scripture says to us, and you shall know the truth. And it is the truth that will set you free. Yeah. And like these organizations, the, the fuel to keep you in bondage is to keep you away from the truth. Mm. So what they do is tell their followers, their members, and so on, their version of the truth. Nevertheless, it's not the truth. So according to spiritual laws, if it is the truth that will set you free, then it is the lack of truth that will keep you in bondage. Yeah. Now, with that said, what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. And in that agreement, both parties agree to certain terms to uh, facilitate a common end goal and there are also penalties embedded in that if either of the parties decide to default on the agreement that they originally made. And this is something that is never explained to such members of these secret societies. The whole idea is to make them believe that they are a part of a brotherhood, a sisterhood. And yeah, if you get in any kind of trouble, we're here for you. If you need employment, blah, blah, so on and so forth. Uh, so the covenant 
is the first thing that they seek because while you're making that pledge or that agreement, what you don't know is you're spiritually tying yourself not to that organization itself. It's beyond that. You're, you're tying yourself to the deity or the spirit that they serve. But of course, they will never tell you this. None of this you will you, you will be privy to. So here it is, you're following all of the uh, rituals and the purpose of these rituals, particularly those that take you from level to devil. Each one of those rituals is another agreement or another covenant. But again, you're being told as if, okay, you have to go through this if you want to get to a certain level. But the truth is it's another covenant or another agreement that's tying you down. In a case like that, God has to honor the covenant that you became a part of because he isn't a God that bullies us. He isn't a God that violates our freedom of expression or free will. Mm -hmm. So you can do whatever you want to do. However, because it's a covenant that comes with consequences and repercussions, then you signed on to that. So most people that sign on to these things, especially when they would have made the pledge, they would normally be... Uh, faced with a lot of dreams, many, many horrible nightmares and so on, or even have spiritual experiences, such as some of them feel as if something is holding them down at night, they feel their bed being shaken, or they begin to hear voices, or when uh, nightfall come, or late at night, they would hear cracks in the roof, or they would see images running past them quickly through their peripherals. All of these things are evidence of the spirits that you've invited into your life as a result as a result of this spiritual covenant that you made under the guise of the pledge that you would have made with that particular organization. In other words, you've been initiated into this particular group. So at that moment, you become their property. They, they literally pull the strings. Now, whoever invited you, whoever invited you, and for the most part, depending on what level they're at, if they had entry level, then they wouldn't know what I'm about to say next. Whoever invited you, they don't realize that at the same time and by inviting you, they're initiating you. Mm. Right. So once you once you come in through them, that's a credit for them. But nevertheless, all of these people that are being invited or actually join, the covenant is the key thing. It, it's it before we can do anything else, we need to secure. This covenant, but again, before that happens, though, they're going to tell you all the beautiful things that the the society has done, and how they have helped the homeless, and and all kind of nonsense they begin to tell you. But all of that is just to lure you in and make you feel even more confident about signing on to their particular uh, organization. Uh, that was the covenant. What was the second part of the question? Before we get to the second part of that question, I want to touch on that because. A lot of people who have this fight about why they shouldn't come out of fraternities and sororities or any secret society of that nature, they're always like, well, we do community service. We do good for the community. We do, you know, such and such and such. We help people do this. We help people do that. And you just said that that is a way to lure people in. Right. I want to emphasize that because people act like that's the end all be all. Like if you are doing community service for this secret society, then you should get a pat on your back or you should get some hands clapping for you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as we see that that's not true. Also no. for the people who don't experience some of, some of the examples that you gave of things that could possibly go wrong for those people who have experienced those. Cause I, don't, I have experienced um, like, hearing bed shaking or seeing like things of that nature. I had horrible my experiences. And then also I felt life was hitting like a glass ceiling mm -hmm. in my prayer life and my spirit. Um, just, I guess going the way that they should have been going. Mm -hmm. So for, for other people who may not have experienced some of those examples you tell us um what are implications of an illegal covenant outside of um the example provided okay outside of the examples that i gave the all the, the the ultimate thing i'm trying to to make clear is that once that initiation or that covenant has been established now remember the victim isn't aware of this 
as far mm-hmm. as they're concerned, they're just making a pledge to be a part of this society. Nevertheless, what is really happening here, and this, this is the purpose of the covenant, it is literally surrendering their destiny over to the God that that particular uh, organization serve. Hence, the examples that I gave, they are but few of many. Like you said, there's this glass ceiling that you cannot go beyond. You become limited, delayed in life. Because why? The spirits that control that particular organization has now the legal right to control you. Now, one would ask, well, why is the covenant so important? I mean, what is the big deal about the covenant? Well, if we go back to the book of Genesis, when God created the earth, he created Adam and Eve, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, after he's already completed everything, the earth, the garden, the Bible says in verse 28, he says, and he blessed them, meaning Adam and Eve, God blessed them to be fruitful, to multiply, and to to replenish the earth. And he's given them, who is this them again? Adam and Eve, human beings, dominion and authority over the earth. Now, the reality is, who, who did he give the power to on the earth to dominate it? mankind. He did not give it to any spirits, including himself. So the rule is, if any spirit wants to participate on this planet here, along with mankind, there has to be an invitation to that spirit. That's the reason why Christians pray, fast, consecrate. That's the reason why occultists do rituals, seance, loves, whatever, because there has to be an agreement between the spirit and the human being in order for that spirit to facilitate its will. If that rule wasn't in place, then Satan could jump on anybody haphazardly. The spirit of lust and depression could just run its course unhindered. So it is these spiritual rules that these spirits have to contend with as it relates to infiltrating the life of mankind. So this is why the covenant, in order for Satan to have his way, he have to get permission But the way that that permission comes in regards to these secret societies, it comes with all of the bells and whistles that they're dangling at you, but not telling you the consequences, the repercussion, the long-term spiritual as well as physical implications that is not only going to be levied on your life, but also the life of the future generation that will come from you. So this is why the covenant is important. They don't want to just lock you down. They want to lock every and anything that will ever come from you to hinder, to delay, whether it's marriage, whether it's promotion. Like, for example, in some people who are initiated, they may do well in their career, but fail miserably in marriage. Some may may just fail Mm. all the way through and not go anywhere at all. And I have learned through my counseling of others with with this, those who fail consistently, even being a part, of this organization, I have discovered that these are the people who are truly called by God to make a difference. So just, so these forces would know that. So they're going to mash this person down from day one. There's going to be relentless in keeping them down. But at the same time, because the spirit dominate them, it is this desire to to still commit to this organization, despite the non-producing seeds that's coming from it. So they will defend it. They will fight it. They will whatever for it, even though deep down they know. It reminds me of some people in church. They've been going to church for 7,000 years. Nothing is happening for them. No <laughs> breakthrough, no miracles, no nothing. Help right? us, Lord. <laughs> right. But they will say to you, hey, look here, I go to church and blah, blah, blah. And you say, okay, what, where's your fruit? How has that benefited you the 27 years you were going here? And what do they do? They get defensive. They get argumentative. They want to fight. Why would you want to fight and argue if this thing was profiting you? So this is the same thing with the secret societies. It is a, it is an, it is organizations who's, who serve Satan, who serve evil spirits. And according to scripture, the Bible is very clear in Deuteronomy 28 in particular, from verse 1 all the way to verse 13, he talk about how he will bless those who observe his laws, his rules, and his commandments, how he will put them on high and advance them, and not just them, but their future generation. But when we drop to verse 14 of Deuteronomy 28, he's now giving this warning. He said, now do not look to the left, neither to the right, 
to serve other gods. Very clear. Then he goes into verse 15. But if you decide not to hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do all his commandments, watch what's going to happen now when you serve these other gods from verse 15. He says, then shall these curses come upon thee and overtake thee. Overtake means to go ahead of you, to deal with your future generation now. So the Bible is telling you well in advance. On the day of judgment, you could never say, well, I didn't know it was there. It doesn't matter. It was always there. You never paid the attention to it. So he's saying if you decide to follow after other deities, Greek gods, letters, whatever, he said you are inviting oppression. Ooh. The Bible says that you will be cursing the field, cursing your body, cursing your storehouses. Everything that you put your hand to will be cursed. He says mm -hmm. you will go you, you, you will go after your enemies one way, but have to scatter from them seven different ways. My and God. The earth above you will be brass, producing absolutely nothing. Listen to this. In verse 30, and this is an interesting one, verse 30 of Deuteronomy 28, still under these curses for those who serve other deities. He says, you will be troth or wife, or you will be engaged or even be married, and other men will sleep with your partner. He said, you will build houses and other people will take it over. So when you look at this and now compare it to those who are part of these secret, and don't mind what they put on the outside, the nice job or whatever the case may be, or if you got in some problems, they have a, a member who's a judge or a prosecution officer. Listen, all of that is fluff and puff. At the end of the day, it's just to get you in. And the minute you get in, they now control your destiny. So I don't care how they put it. I don't care how much they do, the, the signs, whatever. All of that is absolute rubbish because the spiritual implication, and this is the sad part, Portia, it is not just limited to the one who made the oath. The one who made the oath, they now becomes the portal for those spirits to traffic in that particular mm. family bloodline and oppress the other family members aside from the one who originally made the oath. So here, here is the rule for that. So in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 to verse 5, God again begins to warn Israel about serving other deities. I mean, this is like the greatest atrocity ever as far as God was concerned from Israel in terms of their abomination. He said, do not serve any other gods up in the heavens or underneath the earth. He says, for I am a jealous God. Verse 5, he says, but if you decide to serve these other gods, this is his promise now. He said, I will visit your iniquity. So let's stop right there. So what is this iniquity he's talking about? Well, the context of what he's talking about is serving other gods, worshiping them, doing the rituals and all of the seance and all of this other stuff, calling them forth, inviting them in the earth. He said, all of this curses that's coming with them, he said, I will visit these iniquities, these curses upon your current children, and all the way down to the third and fourth generation. So what does this mean? He's saying to you, you as a secret society member, Freemason, Alpha, Delpha, whatever you all call yourself, mm -hmm. he says you are literally securing the destiny, okay, at minimum to the fourth generation. So those who aren't even born, your kids who haven't even come from you as yet, are already marked as curse as a result of the violation of this rule. To top it off, let's go even further. Same Exodus 20, verse 24. And he talks about the altar. God says, if you create an altar unto me, and he gave these specific uh, details on how to do this altar. He said, if you do this altar unto me, he says, I, God, will now visit this altar. And when I come to this altar, I'm going to bring with me blessings. So two things we need to point out here. The altars that you see, there's a spirit behind every altar, depending on whom that altar is erected to. Now, while you may not be able to see that spirit, make no mistake, the spirit is there. According to God wrote laws, according to altar laws, he said, if the altar is raised for God, God says, I promise I will visit if it's erected according to my standard. Mm -hmm. And when I come, I will bring blessings with me. Because the enemy mimics everything that God does, this is the same reason why people of the occult and so on create altars, because they're literally communicating with that spirit. So think about this. If the spirit of God, when he shows up, 
and he's bringing blessings to a godly altar. What do you think happens when an evil altar is raised, which demonic spirits will be attending? What do you think they're bringing with them? Curses. So this is what the the uh, the, the the secret societies don't tell you. This is what they will never say to you. Listen, you could join us, but let me tell you right now, there's many curses of cancers and, and diabetes and generational curses. All of this is going to be a part of your future destiny. Nobody's going to never tell you that because if they did, you would never join. So let me get a little bit deeper for you. Let me get a little bit deeper. And I want you to do the statistics even after we're done with this show. We're going to look at the rate of cancers and so many other diseases that afflict these people <coughs> that you never hear about. But nevertheless, same book of Deuteronomy. He talked about if they continue, I think his verse is either in the 21st or 27th verse, somewhere in Deuteronomy 28. But this is what he says. He says, if you continue to not obey my laws, my rules, he says, I will send the boils upon you that cannot be cured and emeralds. Now that word emeralds, listen carefully, Portia, what this word means. The word emeralds literally means tumors that cannot be healed. Tumors that cannot be healed, you and I know to be cancer. Mm -hmm. So you will see a consistency with these diseases, with these members, with these people. But because they don't read the word of God, they will never connect it that, wow, exactly what the Bible says is going to happen if I was to forge any alliance with any other God. Here it is happening to me. Here it is happening to my cousin. Here it is happening to my family. So a lot of them, those families that you see, with this consistency of cancer, so on a generational case of cancer, for the most part, when you tr travel back up the family line, down the family line, you'll either be connected to one of them being either connected to some secret society or full-fledged into the occult, because these are the curses that accompany such behavior, particularly when you would have forged covenant with these particular societies. My God. That was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My God. Okay. So one of the things I want to pinpoint, first of all, there's so many people out here battling sickness and diseases mm -hmm. and nobody knows the root cause of it. And the thing about it is sometimes in their families, it'd be like trickling down. Mm -hmm. You see grandma had it and auntie had it and your mm -hmm. mama had it and now you had it. Like it'd be out here people having hereditary heart attacks down mm -hmm. a whole bloodline and nobody knows where it's from but every but most a lot of people in the black community are mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. fraternities and sororities mm -hmm. or other types of secret societies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and here we are we're getting some answers we're getting some answers because a lot of people be out here thinking like, yeah, my life is fine. Everything's all fine and dandy. I'm in this. I'm in this fraternity. I'm in this sorority. Ain't nothing happened to me. Ain't nothing happened to my family. We all good. We live in a good life. Right. But there are generational things happening mm -hmm. that nobody can attest for. Mm hmm. And because you you pointed out the scripture where he said, I will visit the iniquities mm -hmm. of the third and fourth generation, mm -hmm. you don't know what you done signed your kids up for. No. no. But you know what? That's just scratching the surface, Portia. Let me, let me, let me, I think you need to strap in right now because I'm about to plunge very Wait. deep right now. Okay. I think you need to strap it because what I'm about to say next is going to rock the black church. Oh, Jesus. Right now. And I really want you to hear me because, see, when we think about these things, we just think about the fraternity and sorority itself, the Freemasons, the Eastern side itself. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. For for ages now, time immemorial, these things has worked its way into the so-called houses of God, which I don't think they are. If your pastor is a Freemason, if your a choir director, your first lady is an Eastern star or regular fraternity so on let me, let me let me explain because like how i'm saying that now if there are people watching or listening they're probably quick to say oh he doesn't know what he's talking about he's all wrong but i don't care what they say because everything that i'm going to say tonight and you would notice i back up with scripture i just Let's give go. you spiritual rules that's all my job is now how you debate it how you accept or reject it have nothing to do with me anymore i did my job and I go about my business. So watch this. So here it is. Your pastor is a Freemason. 
okay? Or whatever sorority you're part of. Now, most people don't think anything of it. In fact, this would this is what this would, would encourage most people to remain in their fraternity or their secret society. Because if they're saying of the man or woman of God is a part of that, then Kevin is talking a lot of rubbish. Now, what they don't know, and another thing they would say too, well, that's between the past and God, and that have nothing to do with me <clears throat> as a member. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I have everything to do with you. Here is why. Let's go again to spiritual laws. In our black churches, they're noted for be calling our pastors spiritual fathers, calling first lady spiritual mother, or we call the elders the mother of the church. Okay, so you would have established this quote unquote spiritual parent child relationship. Well, there, 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 there are benefits as well as there are spiritual consequences that comes along with that. So if I call my pastor, let's say my pastor is a 33 degree Freemason, all right? Full-fledged mm -hmm. active member, but he's the preacher of the word of God and he know how to put down the word. Well, according to spiritual law, even though, even though he, even though I'm not a Freemason, but yet I sit under this, According to spiritual law, and I read it to you earlier, God says, okay, I will visit the iniquity of your spiritual father, the one who's a Freemason slash preacher, upon you, his spiritual children, all the way to the third and fourth generation. My That's God. what the word of God says. He says, this, this, this is what will become of you. Not only that, <clears throat> in, a, in a Romans, Romans chapter 1, I think verse 32. But before you get to verse 32, Paul began to say how all of these unrighteous people know that they will be punished, the fornicator, the idolater, the liars, the murderers, and so on. In verse 32, listen to what he says. He says, not only those who would have committed these uh, breaches and violation against the Lord our God, but those who approve them, those who enable them, those who applaud them will be equally punished as the one who actually did it. So when you when you say a person is your spiritual father, you don't know what this brother into. This brother could be a full-fledged homosexual, could be a full-fledged voodoo worker, could be a full-fledged mason or whatever. You know none of that. And some people don't know. <clears throat> but they want to get personal. Oh, I don't care what Kevin says. Kevin is angry with the church and he bitter against the pastors. No, Kevin understands spiritual rules. Mm -hmm. Kevin understands spiritual laws. So now, as their life begins to digress, we're talking about the parishioners now, and they're wondering, why is it that I was here for so long and we're not prospering? We're paying our tithe, we're giving our seed, we're doing all of this. We, we attend the church functions, we support our pastors, but why are not only our lives not going ahead, but we're watching the same cycle of defeat that we experience. We're literally looking at our children and grandchildren experiencing the exact same defeat that we went through. As a, as a mother, you had two kids for two different men. You didn't plan this. Okay, things happen. You watch your daughter who you raised up do the exact thing. You watch your granddaughter do the exact, but you will never connect it to your Eastern Star affiliations. You will never connect it to your Freemason, your sorority, your Delta, Alpha Pi, whatever. You will never, you know why? Because you don't know spiritual laws. You don't understand spiritual rules. As far as you're concerned, the only rules that you need to know is what that particular society says to you. My God, that is so good. <clears throat> That is so good. And that is so deep. You know, sometimes we don't know what we sign ourselves up for. Okay. We do not no. know. No, we don't. Okay. Briefly, before we get into altars, because I want you to explain that. I know you have mentioned it, but I want you to actually say um, what an altar is. But before yes. that, um, he talked about, you, you mentioned um, don't serve other gods, right? Um and the implications in Deuteronomy 28, what could happen when that happens, right? So when it comes to the Black church again, and a lot of, you know, African-Americans who are in fraternities and sororities, 
we tell them, you know, from people who know the truth now, we say that these organizations are idolatry. They say, no, they're not because they're not serving that particular organization. Right. Like for me, if somebody back in the day, you know, this is pre pre renouncement. If somebody was to tell me like, yeah, you know, being a Delta is idolatry, blase, blase. I would have responded like, well, I do not idolize Delta. I don't give it all of my time. I don't, you know, put it before anything. Da, 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 da. <laughs> So really quickly, I just want to go over what deities are in representation for each organization. So I wrote it here in this book called out fraternities and sororities. Right. So these are the black Greek letter organizations. And I made sure that I put it in here so that people know, because this is not a joke. And the thing about it is. Um, a lot of people who are in these fraternities and sororities be like, oh, well, the, the Greek God thing don't really matter. And our founders were studying Greek in college at that time. So mm -hmm. that's why they gave it the, the emblem or the symbol or the what, whatever. It don't matter that they were studying Greek. Right. They should never did it. OK, but here we are. So for Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, they have uh, the 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 Sphinx, I think I'm saying it right, Sphinx, Sphinx of Giza, that's an Egyptian god. Omega Psi Phi fraternity, they have Anubis or An Anubis. They got some other kind of dog god too, that's a Greek god, interesting. Um, for Kappa Alpha Psi, these are other fraternities, Apollo, um, Phi Beta Sigma, they got Hor Horus, the Egyptian god, Iota Phi Theta, they got Sin, forgive me for, I mean, well, actually, God, out to the Alpha, Alpha they got Quetzal, uh, some type of Greek or Greek God, then the Hasmoner, talk a lot about that, my God, they make, they make us say, you have to embrace like crazy um zeta phi beta um they have best and sigma gamma these Egyptian and greek are what is these authors when they tell us what is just the basic stand can you hear me I can you know? Yep. <clears throat> I can you. Can you can you tell us what and is? Did I go out? Yeah, you're going in and out. You asking me? Oh, what, you. You asking me what an altar is? Yes. Okay. So, what exactly is an altar? Well, remember what I said earlier in the conversation. I was saying to you that in order for spirits uh, to, and when I say tell people this, they they get offended. I don't know why. When in order for spirits to have legal right here on this planet, there the medium they have to come through is mankind. Now, this isn't my opinion. This is scripture. God made it very clear in His Word. I have given dominion over this earth, not to Gabriel the angel, not to Michael the archangel, to none of them, not even to Jesus, not even to Himself. He said. And this is not to say man is greater. I'm just telling you the rules he put in. Don't come after me. Go after God. So God said, I've given man dominion, mankind. In other words, this is what he did. He says, listen, I've already created the earth. Now here, Adam and Eve, you take the key and you are now the landlords. You're the owners of the earth. You're the one that's steward over this earth. And because I've given you mankind, which is spirit, soul, and body dominion, then any other spirit, including himself, you must invite us. Anyone you want of us to, you want our help, be it demonic or the kingdom of God. Well, but God, you know, we go into prayer, we go into fasting, consecration, whatever that is, to invite the Spirit of God. So, with that said, an altar is a place where sacrifices are made. It's in a place, this it is a place, and this, this is the key here. It is a place where destinies are changed. Mm, help destinies are changed see because when they go to that altar see you have to understand there's a spirit behind the altar mm. 
And let me just give you a quick example. In 1 Kings chapter 13, there was this prophet, the Bible didn't give him a name, whom God had sent to prophesy for the, the, to the king of, I think, Israel, Jeroboam. He was a wicked king, he dealt heavily into sorcery. In fact, he was leading Israel into a sorcery act. So when the no-name prophet came to Jeroboam, Jeroboam was at the altar at that time, uh, servicing the altar or satisfying the, the, the deity at that altar. So the man of God began to prophesy, and Jeroboam didn't like it. And Jeroboam said, get him. Now, most people just read over the story and do not see what's being done here. The only two people present at this altar is Jeroboam at the altar and the man of God who just came and gave the, the decree that God gave him to give to Jeroboam. So if these are the only two people at the altar, when Jeroboam command that they get the man of God, who was this day that he was referring to when it was only him and the man of God? Well, he's referring to the deities at that altar. So what I'm saying to you, even though you cannot see it, even though you don't see a physical presence, an altar, sorry, a, a spirit is at that altar. So the, the purpose of the altar is where they come at this altar. And depending on the spirit that they're serving, each spirit have different requirements. For example, some altars you would see with fruits and vegetables and so on. Uh, some altars could be a tree out in the forest, a tall, huge tree that they bow and they worship. Some altars, people who live on coastal areas, you would see them going into the sea and doing different rituals and throwing the water over them and spinning around seven times. So while you may not be able to see it, there are altars there. And those spirits... In order for them to do your bidding, whomever seeking their uh, assistance, then there are certain requirements. For example, they will say, okay, uh, Portia, you want to be successful. You want to be uh, rich. Well, we need you to get a uh, couple items, uh, two eggs, uh, bring a, a bottle of water. Whatever it is that they're asking you to bring is irrelevant. It means nothing. What is important here is that you're actually following the instructions that you are given. Because by following the instructions that you are given, you are coming in agreement with that spirit. Mm. That is now going to give that spirit the legal right to now come into your life, to attach itself to your bloodline. Now, it's going to do some stuff for you. But the, the negative things that's going to go down in your life and by extension, your future generation is pale in comparison in terms of what they claim to do and what will really happen to you. So the altar now, once that happened, a sacrifice is made. So they get some animal, cut off the chicken head or goat. And depending on the sacrifice, the greater the sacrifice is the great or the high ranking, the deity it is that you're dealing with. So what is the purpose of the sacrifice? The sacrifice is what seals the covenant deal, meaning that this is what we agree to. So we're going to now slaughter this animal right here, put the blood over this altar, whatever it is that they do. And this now seals the deal, meaning that you have no idea, Portia, that you are in covenant with this spirit for life unless someone with spiritual eyes see this and break this. But until then, this spirit will dominate your life till the day you die. And when it's done with you, it goes to the next family member. So each family member has a time set on them for when the spirit or these spirits will begin to run its course in these individual lives. None of this, uh, the sorority, the uh, fraternity, the Eastern Star, the Freemasons, none of them will tell you this. And most of them who are joining are ignorant to this. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's for the for the Freemasons, it's only when they get like to the 20th degree that they realize that they're serving the devil, Baphomet. Mm. But by that time, they're so polluted, they're so entrenched by these demonic forces that even if they wanted to leave, they're so filled with fear. So with that said, let's go to this point. When you would have made your pledge, there's a certain thing that you have to recite. And if you literally listen to what is being said, that if you reveal these secrets, how they would gorge out your eyes and start, all kind of foolishness what they'll do to your family, you must ask yourself, why are these things 
in this particular covenant that is so gruesome and even affecting my future generation who have nothing to do with the pledge that I'm making to your organization. Now you begin to see the spiritual implication that not only do they want to secure your destiny, but they want to secure the destiny of your future seeds, your future generation through your commitment or through your covenant with them. So people have zero idea when they get involved in these things, what they're up against. Most of them lose their mind. Most of them lose it all. <clears throat> and they have no idea for the most part. They will die from some vicious, strange disease. But the purpose of them dying from this vicious strange because they will now sacrifice. And they have no idea. Mm. So yeah, that's what the altar is all about. It's to just, uh, it's not only establish the covenant, but they ultimately change the destiny of the one who's being initiated to that particular organization. Your destiny is now controlled by Satan himself, whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not. Okay, I have a question. It's kind of like weird, so I'm gonna explain it. But I wanna know, can the things that are sacrificed be like a collaborative collaborative of things that has already transpired. And when I ask that, I ask that because um, for Delta, there is an altar, right? I actually have their initiation ritual pulled up and it say some wild stuff, mm -hmm. but they have to, when, when we, when you do the initiation ritual to get into Delta Sigma Theta sorority, there is a table. Then there is a torch of wisdom. That torch of wisdom has to be lit. And then it's like so many things, but they say so many wild things, right? So um, before doing the initiation ritual, there is a process to get into the organization. And sometimes it's an underground process, like the one that I went through. Mm -hmm. So when you said sacrifice and you mentioned blood, I wanted to know if like old blood that has already transpired could be a sacrifice when they get to the initiation ritual part, because in Delta during the underground process, they had this one chant that was called blood, sweat and tears. Right. So we used to have to say blood. It, we have to sing it, but I'm going to mm -hmm. just say it. it. We used to have to say blood, sweat and tears and tears to be a Delta. It's so hard. It's so hard. Right. And we had to get on our knees and mm -hmm. sweep across a gym floor back and forth while singing that thing like mm -hmm. and across the floor on our knees and by the time we got up because they would make us do it so many times while singing the song back and forth on our knees I, we would get up and our knees be all bloody and scraped up and stuff right mm -hmm. and then sometimes like depending on what fraternity or sorority you come in throughout the underground process they they, they done done something to make you bleed for my process that I went through, that was one of the ones that they did to make us bleed, like skating across the floor on our knees back and forth, singing that Delta chant. So I want to know, can stuff like that that has already happened during the process, but not necessarily on the day of, be a representation of a blood sacrifice when we actually when people actually get to the altar of the initiation ritual? Right. Well, quick answer, yes. But to be more detailed with the answer is <clears throat> a blood sacrifice simply means that the deity that they serve or the deity that was called up demands blood. Let me give an example. Let's say somebody in your family was into sorcery or witchcraft and a part of their sacrifice to the deity or God that they're seeking solutions and answers from, they would have to slaughter a chicken. Okay, so that deity, every time you come before it, it will require blood. Some deities will require fruits or the different stuff that they require. But let's deal with the blood one. Mm -hmm. The problem here is with what you guys were doing, not only does it require blood, the deity that you cannot see, but the process to get that blood must inflict pain on the ones who is doing the ritual. So that thing that you were singing and you're moving from one side, that's an actual ritual. And that mm. ritual, right, is to bring pain to the one who's doing it until blood come forth to satisfy the deity. So let's go back to a family member. Let's say you have a family member who's doing sorcery, but the deity that they serve requires blood. 
So they slaughter chicken every time they go there or an animal and pour the blood over the altar. Now, let's just say that family member dies and they're no longer able to come and present this offering or this sacrifice. So this is now where troubles break loose because now that same spirit, because remember, they don't need that family member anymore. The family member has already made the agreement that has invited this particular deity into the bloodline. So what you're going to see now, you're going to see mysterious and strange deaths among the family members. Why though? Because the deity that was serviced by blood from that family member who's died is a now search of blood. So every day, <clears throat> sorry, every whatever time of the year that this family member have to come and make the sacrifice and that family member isn't there anymore, somebody from this family is going to die. Mm. Now, Kevin, how do you know that's the reason why they're dying? Because the way that they're going to die is going to be so horrific, whether it's a horrible car accident, shot, murdered. The way that they're going to die is not going to be a normal death. Because this, and this is just an example of how vicious this deity is. Because the minute that deity cannot be supplied with the required blood sacrifice, then somebody got to pay. Mm. So this is why the let's go let's go back to the scripture again. And uh Deuteronomy 20, verse 15, he says, If thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do uh, all his laws and commands. He says, listen, he says, then shall these curses come upon thee. Who is this thee? The one who's actu actually practicing it. But watch how this law ties in your family so that even if you're not on the scene anymore, the family will begin to pay. He says, not only will these curses come upon, come upon you, but the curses shall overtake you. The word overtake, Portia, means to go ahead meaning I'm going to now deal with your descendants. I'm going to deal with your future generation. So this is why you will see this repetition of, of, of tragedy, of horror, of poverty, of lack from generation to generation. It is a consistency of it. And for me, who was fully aware of this, all I see is spiritual laws in place. Would others see who don't know spiritual laws? Oh, my God. It is so sad that this family, God forbid, let's just pray for them, not knowing there's a legal agreement that nobody knows about that's giving these deities the, the right, and God has to honor the covenant because they made it, and he cannot override nobody's will until somebody break that evil covenant or someone recognize it and shut it down. Until then, that will go on until Christ return. Wow. Yes, Wow. I've wow. seen it happen over and repeatedly. And it's just amazing how people, when they are blind to these things, they 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 defend Satan and his kingdom so ignorantly. Oh, you're talking foolishness. We are about brotherlyhood and sisterlyhood, and we help the poor. And we, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. All of that is to cover it up. All of that is to not ever expose you to the truth. So that's why I open up my statement and I said to you, scripture law again. Scripture law says this. And you shall know the truth. And the, what will set you free? The, the truth. truth. So yeah. therefore, the opposite is truth. What is keeping them in bondage? Because they are not being exposed to the truth. The minute you were exposed to the truth, you got a hold of it. You now begin to take measure to get up out of there. My God. Right. My God. This is so crazy. I think because a lot of the times we we get in this thing and we just be so gung ho about the title and the accolades and all of these things, not knowing so much is attached to it. OK, I actually have. Let me tell you. So and people who say that there are no, quote unquote, altars or spiritual activity in fraternities and sororities, that is a lie because every initiation ritual has an altar before it. But let me tell you something else. We had a there was another altar at Delta during the underground process to name a duck. So like ducks are the unofficial animal or the underground animal of Delta Sigma Theta. So they have the elephant, which is the official animal. Then the unofficial one is a duck because one of the founders used to collect 22 ducks, something like that. I don't know. I don't forgot. But anyway, so one time there was a table set. 
and there was a bowl on the table with candles and we were in a dark room and it was only candles lit, a table set and a bowl. And we each had a rubber ducky and we had to name this duck, go to the table one by one, wash it in the water and whatever name we gave the duck was supposed to be, I guess, the affirmation for our life or something like that. When I tell you, I don't remember whatever I named that duck, but I promise you the opposite happened. If I named the duck prosperity, the opposite happened. OK, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how detrimental these authors are. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even remember. But what I do know is whatever I gave that name, it was something good. And the opposite transpired in my life after that. And I just think that's so wild that people be in denial about this. Like, no, y'all, we really went through this. Right. And no, this was actually wrong. And they no. don't understand. They think they think like since fraternities and sororities aren't as bad as the Freemasonry and Eastern Star, where you got where you find out later on that you serve in um, the, the devil. But at the end of the day, these are the gateways like to get into that. It's just a branch off from it. I'll, I'll take it a step further for you. The thing about the duck that you just said, <clears throat> and you were supposed to name it, and you got the opposite. That that is a normal, that is a normal ritual. In fact, that's even done in churches, where you have a false prophet who will prophesy mm -hmm. over you, and he or she would say to you, because uh, clearly they're hearing from familiar spirits, meaning that everything they're doing is occultically based. But of mm -hmm. course. The average Christian don't know that because they got a lot of debt over their head and they just want some kind of freedom. So he would say to them, and in fact, I was a victim of this. And I did a lot of teaching and writing on this because I've experienced it for his time. And this guy, I'll never forget it, 2005, never forget it. And he prophesied to me and he said to me, he told me a lot of stuff. But the ending part of his prophecy, he said to me, he said, this was 2005, 2005 March was it March? I'd say March anyway he said to me he said God is going to bless you so tremendously that not only will you be set for the rest of your life but you will never ever have to worry, worry about bills again now at that time I just purchased a, a fourplex and I was having so much trouble with the uh, contractors and so on that was music to my ears because I really needed to get this place done because of course, when I got the mortgage on it, they gave me like a, a one month grace period before they start the mortgage. And anyway, he said the month of April, 2005, I was then, I was in March at that point when they told me this, he said, God is showing him that the month of April is going to be a year, sorry, a month of where your debt will be canceled. You will have, have, the only thing he was short of saying is that I'll be a multimillionaire, but based on all of the contents of what he said, that's what he was scaring to. So, of course, I was excited. Now, it was very much skeptical of him at the beginning, but that's another story. Anyway, I couldn't wait for April to come because I'm saying in my mind, I'm going to be able to walk into that bank and pay them off their loan, tell them get out of my face and live my rich life. Mm -hmm. Feb sorry. April of that year, 2005, was the worst financial month for me to date. I've never mm. experienced. So what I learned later on when I really began to study the occult and all of this witchcraft stuff, what I learned is that when you have false prophets or people who serve other gods, there's a ritual where you get the opposite to what they're proclaiming. Now, in order for that to happen, they still have to secure your agreement. So right after they would have tell you, I see God is going to make you a millionaire. I see a lot of money coming. Uh, do you believe the word of the Lord? Oh, yes, I do. But which Lord is he talking about? Mm. He never said Jesus Christ. He never said the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. He never. So he know once he says, Lord, especially in the black church, or oh, you go into town with that. But you have no idea that you're agreeing with a demonic force. So that force saying yes, because all they wanted was the agreement. The agreement become the covenant for me to change the destiny of Kevin's life. Mm. So everything, well, long story short, I end up losing the, the fourplex long run. Everything that I put into it, I lost everything. So going back to what you said, My God. when you was given that thing, because the altar is the one that gives the instructor the instructions to give those who are following this ritual. 
So when you said prosperity or whatever, whoever else said whatever, that ritual is you were to get the opposite of what you're pronouncing here. And that's why the scripture, again, they're following spiritual laws, death and life reside in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. See, all of these are scriptural laws, you know. Even the kingdom of darkness have to abide. They, they cannot create their own laws or supersede the laws of God. Everything that they do is enshrouded in the laws of God. They, they cannot create their own laws. And mm. this is what the church needs to know. This is what the people of these fraternities need to know. These people who you're dealing with, they are operating by spiritual rules. And they're finding and getting glory out of the ignorance of their victim. So the, 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 the victim believed that, hey, man, I'm going to be a so-so one of these days, an alpha calpa, whatever, and I'm going to be able to rub shoulders with the judge and superstars and so on at the expense of what? Your destiny. Mm, mm, mm. Your destiny. And it doesn't end there. Your future generation will pay as a result of that. Why? Because you would have met all of the spiritual requirements to facilitate the evil that's about to unfold in your life. I just want to go through about three quick scriptures here to show you, just like how you talk about the altars when you all had those different stuff, and to, to prove to you that there are demons at those altars that you cannot see. So <clears throat> in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7, right? This is good. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7 says, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices. Now he's talking, Moses is talking about the children of Israel. They shall no longer offer their sacrifices, listen, listen, unto devils. So the key here is, Portia, there are no physical devils at the altar that you're at. They're invisible, they're spirits. But the fact of the matter is, the, the, the sacrifices that you're doing there, you are doing it unto devils. So he says, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. They shall be a statue forever unto, unto them throughout the generations, right? Let's look at another one. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. Deuteronomy 32, verse 17 says, they sacrifice, he's talking about the children of Israel, unto devils, not to God. To mm. God, small g, whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. He's talking about demons and devils. That when they were at these altars, performing these rituals, these dances, and making these pledges, and cutting up themselves, and pouring the blood over the, the, the altars, while you may have not seen the physical demons that are there, they are there, and that is exactly whom and what they were serving. Let's look at another one here. And this one here I love in uh, Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 to 21. Listen to what it says. But I say, this is now Paul in the New Testament talking to the church of Corinth about these same things we're talking about right now. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, such as the Freemasons, such as the witchcraft worker, the, the sorority people, the fraternity. He says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, listen, they sacrifice unto devils My and God. not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Very clear. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 10. He says, you, you are bishop, slash Freemason, you evangelist slap, slash Freemason, you apostle slash uh, Alpha, whatever, whatever, Delta, whatever. He says in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 10, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You Help cannot us, be partakers of the Lord's table, which is an altar, and of the table of devils. In other words, you cannot serve to master if your pastor is a freemason then you are in a which the bible label as a synagogue of devils my god okay so for the people who say that fraternities and sororities is not as bad as freemasonry and they think it's not that deep what do you say to them well to, to be quite honest with you i 
You see, you could only argue based on where you're at in terms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's my favorite scripture that I quote all the time is in uh, Proverbs 11, 9b. And it says, through knowledge well, the shall the just be delivered. Be delivered. So it's very difficult for them to understand. There's another scripture I think is in 2 Corinthians, I think 3 verses 3 to 4, somewhere around there. And it says, Paul says, listen, if our gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, be hid or not understood, it is only hid or not understood to those who are lost. Watch what he says next now. In whom the God of this world, small g, he's talking about Satan, in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds. So mm. I would never... Blind their minds! Right, not their eyes. Not their eyes. See, he blind their mind, meaning that if I blind your mind, even though you see it in the Bible like heaven showed you, even though you're hearing the scripture, because your mind, which processes your, what you see and what you hear, if that's not functioning correctly, then what Kevin and what Porsche is saying is utter foolishness to them. My God. So I don't, I pray for people like that. I don't, I don't, I don't contend with them. I don't debate with them because again, they will only argue as to where their knowledgeable is and where their knowledge ends in these areas. So the only thing you could do for them it's is pray. pray. <laughs> and not just pray, you do such things like what you're doing now, because just like myself and the many other people who my teachings are affected, I don't need to know them. I planted the seed when they listened to what I had to say. Whether they turned it off midway, whether they only listened to 10 minutes of it, it was 10 minutes worth of God word, which is the true seed invested. Now, one day in the future, hopefully, if something go down, then they're going to remember this. And it's going to start now their journey to righteousness. So my job, your job, is to not force, just plant the seed of the word of God. That's it. My God, that is so good. All right. I am opening the floor for a Q&A for the audience. So those of you who are on and would like to ask our special guest, Pastor Kevin, any questions, please drop them in the chat right now now drop your questions in the chat as it pertains to all things covenants altars um secret societies fraternities and sororities whatever you want to ask him along those lines since those are the top that's the topic of the day please ask those questions in the chat so that um we can get some answers okay because y'all see he's an open book and he's not even an open book by himself he open book with the book backing okay. him up okay with the book of all books got his back. He 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 spit only scripture. He only spit scripture. Uh Porsche, if I could just if you allow me or permit me just for a second, there's something yeah. that I, I have to add in all of this. <clears throat> Once you're initiated into a secret society, no matter what that secret society is, and remember, as we would have I would have read to you in scripture, your your fellowshipping with demons, even though you don't see them. Mm. Demons are running that. Now, once you make the pledge, and I want to be very clear, once you make that pledge, Portia, there are what is known as monitoring spirits, also interchangeable with familiar spirits that are attached to you. So from that day forward, you are being monitored spiritually. So whatever you're doing, there's a spirit attached to you. So let's say the head of your organization, the very, very top, that spirit will report to them. That spirit know Porsche is talking to a Christian. That spirit know everything Porsche like, whether you're, you have sexual issues, whether you're an alcoholic, what, whatever your vices are. And it is the job of that spirit to literally indulge you in those things while reporting on you. Now, here's the evidence of this. The evidence of this is that, and this is one of the first areas that one will begin to see the change in their destinies and it will be through their dreams after making these initiations. Now, there are going to be two sets of people here. The first one is those who are going to be, uh, I mean, bombarded with dreams, but the dreams are going to be so negative, negative dreams. Now, what is really happening here? You see, the spirits of those altars are literally showing you your destiny in those dreams. They're revealing them to you. Then there are others who would have dreams, but the minute that they were to get up, the dream has been erased from them. They mm. can't remember it, and they become frustrated 
or they'd be like, you know, I don't even dream. But trust me, everybody dreams. So yeah. that dream has been erased from them because what the dream is showing them, and normally this would happen to people who have some kind of knowledge about the word of God or the spiritual realm. Again, the monitoring spirit is aware of this. So the job of that monitoring spirit is to erase any form of information or knowledge. Why? According to spiritual law, it is through knowledge that you will be delivered. My God. So I got to keep this knowledge away from you to remove any chance of deliverance. So we must immerse this person into whatever. So those people who, who especially those who already finished with college and so on and deep into their alpha, delta, whatever, and still doing whatever, pledges, whatever, whatever they're doing, they, they think they're in control of their lives and they are they are so highly deceived. Their lives are totally dictated by the spirits that they made covenant with unknowingly. And those spirits are watching them 24. If they're having dreams with cats and dogs and crocodiles and centipedes, all of these are just the likeness of the spirits of that altar. If you're having dreams over and repeatedly, dogs chasing you, dogs running you down and biting you. If, if you really look at it, mark when these dreams are happening. Usually you've been watching some Christian program or somebody talked to you about Christ or you're sitting down pondering what are you going to do with your life and you really should get your life together. So these things now begin to attack you in the dream. Now the dream is really real because the dream is the spiritual world. That's the world that you cannot see. And it's now giving you excerpts of your spiritual life and how these evil forces are dictating and pulling the strings to your life. So I there are many that. people who want to get out of it right now, but that, that spirit that's on them is literally coercing them and enticing them to stay in it. But it's a fight, but they wouldn't admit to it, but it's a fight and, and they will tell you they're not happy. There's no, no matter what they put on on the outside, no matter how successful they may be, only one person could fill that void, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. My God, that is so good. That is so good. And it's about to free a lot of people who have been having crazy, wild dreams. And if I could be just completely transparent, I think I even, I wrote about it in this book, called out, y'all. <laughs> but one, that's how I found you. That is how I found you. When it came to me deciding to get my relationship with God right, and deciding to fast, the first thing was dream attacks. I'm talking about crazy men mm -hmm. chasing me in my dreams. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first email I ever sent mm -hmm. you. Like crazy men chasing me in my dreams, cats, like they would scratch my arms and hands and all kinds of stuff. I was attacked by cats so much in mm -hmm. my dreams. Witches. Cats I represent to, witches. Oh my gosh. I used to be like, what is happening? I'm like, dude, I'm like, who knows that I'm out here praying and fasting? Who knows? <laughs> But now that you are saying that once we pledge and sign up for these things, it is monitoring spirits mm -hmm. assigned to us. Oh, my gosh. It makes so much sense. I was attacked every single like it got man. This is this. This is how I found you, too, because it got so crazy to the point where I was scared to go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. I would literally wait until like. 6 a.m. when the sun came up to go to sleep and only sleep for a couple of hours because I had mm -hmm. to wake up and clock in for work because, you know, we was all working from home back in 2020. Mm -hmm. But before clocking in from work, I only had three hours of sleep. So every day I was getting like three hours of sleep or I would try to take a nap when the when the sun was up because I was just so scared to go to sleep at night because every night I would wake up in a panic and my heart would be dropped from the kind of dreams that I was having. Mm -hmm. Anxiety and attacks. If it wasn't for you, I would have never known. So, oh my God, this is such a full circle moment. <laughs> I don't. I feel like I'm gonna get emotional again, so I don't want to talk about it. But my God, I thank God for your life. I thank God for your teachings. I know I probably should ask you this off camera, but I really would love if we could do a part two talking about dreams. Of you know, course. Of call course. out a crazy dream. Oh, look, you said, of course, and y'all be on the lookout for that because it's happening. <laughs> but my God, my dreams being crazy mm -hmm. was how I got to this point. I would have <clears throat> never knew to denounce Delta. I would have never knew to come up out of this secret society if I didn't start having crazy dreams. It was bad. I was scared to go to sleep. I had never been scared to go to sleep in my life. I've been grown. Even right. when I was a kid, I was okay with sleeping in the dark. 
But that's enough about me. Y'all, let's get to these questions. The first question on the list was, is a very important question that I meant to ask, but since somebody asked it, here we are. How do you get out of illegal covenants and altars? That's a beautiful question. And that one I'm going to approach with great caution in terms of those who are not believers of Jesus. If you, let me tell you something. If you are not a person who've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're trying to pull out of these situations, you you literally begging for problems. You you Ooh. see because you have no spiritual protection. There are only two worlds. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of darkness. And both of those worlds are in terms of a human being. One of those worlds has to be sponsoring you or supporting you. So you cannot say as a non-believer of Jesus Christ, I'm going to pull away from my particular organization and I'm going to live happily ever after. That will never happen. You have to have a stronger support to defend or to fight for you because they're going to come with all that they have. You know why? Because as far as they're concerned in that world, unlike the kingdom of light, you are their territory. You are their property. Let me give you another spiritual rule to back this. The Bible talk about, I think it's in uh, Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. And it says that when an evil spirit is cast out of a person, it goes into dry places seeking rest, and it finds none. And it says to itself, meaning that it can reason, let me go back to my house, or let me go back to the person that I once inhabited. Now think about this. However you would have gotten that spirit out, but you don't have Christ, right? When the spirit now comes back to reenter, who or what is going to stop it? How will your human power prevent that from happening? So you see when I say to you, you have to have a spiritual support in terms of the kingdom of God. Because trust me, they, it's, they're going to be relentless. And the foot, the foot soldiers, I should have said this earlier, the foot soldiers to their attack is the spirit of fear, the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of, of worry. Uh, our Bible says to us in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, it says that God did not give us what? The spirit. The spirit of fear. The spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Mm -hmm. But instead he gave us love, power, and soundness of mind. And these are the three things that these spirits primarily come after. And that's why you find most people who try to pull out of these things lose their mind, end up walking mm -hmm. the streets aimlessly. Because they're coming after that mind to send you out of your mind. So you need to get your life right with Christ first before you ever consider trying to pull away from these organizations. Now, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, if the way Christian. to get out of this is you have to fast. Uh, in the book of Matthew uh, 17, the book of Matthew 17 uh, spoke about this young man who was possessed uh, with these spirits, and his father brought him to the disciples who failed to heal the boy. Long story short, the father, in his impatience and couldn't take it anymore, took his boy to Jesus. And he says, listen, I had my son to your, your students here, and they failed miserably in delivering my son. Anyway, Jesus said to them, long story short, he says, listen, disciples, this kind of spirit here. So right there, Jesus is saying, not all spirits are on the same level. The word kind here speaks about a different rank, a higher order, a different breed or class. He says, this kind will only come out, uh, that's Matthew 17, 21, will only come out through what? Through prayer and fasting. So what Jesus is also saying is that there are certain deities or forces that you could pray against, but prayer alone won't work. You'll be praying over and over. Just as like you say, oh Lord, take this secret society spread over me and you just pray and nothing happens. In fact, things get worse because now they're going to fight to maintain their territory. So Jesus says you have to add another component to praying and that is fasting. You must fast in order to give you that spiritual power or assistance or aid to now sever. Now, once that's done, you have to now begin to renounce. You have to renounce every covenant, every pledge, and really repent to God, break ties, and that's going to be the key because it is that covenant that becomes the fuel or gives them the right to traffic in their life. Now, the most common thing that happens once a person is free, 
the next phase of these spirits because now they're going to, like I said, do whatever it takes to keep, to regain their territory. So their first opera of op or their first method of operation is to convince the victim that they're not free. Mm. Right. That's it. They're going to convince them because they're certain they're going to try to come back and try to bring those desires for things of the sorority or whatever, or try to connect them with people or, or they will even send agents in to try to recruit them. We recruit them, but the idea is to attack the mind. Mm. God didn't really deliver you. God is God isn't checking for you. God doesn't love you. They're gonna turn your family against you. But these are the spirits. They're fighting for that territory. So they're gonna turn everyone, everything you might, you're gonna lose your job. You probably won't be promoted. Everything that can go bad. Because what it wants you to do is say, you know what? I might as well just go back over here. At least I was getting some kind of favor on this hand. So it's a strategy. It is the ideal strategy to re-recruit that person to, as far as the kingdom of darkness is concerned, you're that prodigal son, you're that prodigal daughter, come back to Papa. But if you don't know spiritual laws and rules and principles, more than likely you will succumb to that. So that's, that's going to be the first thing if you decide to quit. They're gonna, then you're going to have manifestations. Spirit of fear is going to come there because they're the... They're the uh, foot soldiers to the kingdom of darkness. They're going to come and try to overcome you with anxiety, uh, uh, fear. And the next stage is depression. You just feel lonely because what your crew, who you're once a part of, they're going to fall back and disassociate with you because now they want you yeah. to come seeking friendship again. But all of this is a strategy. You're not the only person that they are doing this to. Anyone who tries to pull away, these are the protocols that we must now inflict on this person in order to reel them back in. Man, they be out here talking so bad about people who denounce. Yeah. yeah. They be talking so bad. Let me tell y'all something. Let me just let me just put this out here real quick. I, Portia Carter, do not care. <laughs> How bad you talk about me? What you got to say about me? I don't got nothing against nobody. I'm just out here doing what the Lord has called me to do. I am just out here doing what the Lord has called me to do. If you got something to say about it, take it up with him. Because look, you want to argue and I can't argue with you. Okay. <laughs> Let me just say that. But all right. Our next question. Somebody said, will being a member of these organizations keep one out of heaven if they have accepted Jesus Christ? You will be tossed out of heaven. I just keep you up because remember, you're serving. Remember, oh. what I just read, you know, I said to you, what did Paul say? Paul says, you cannot sit at the table of the Lord and at the tables of devils. You cannot drink from the Lord's cup and the, the, the cup of devils. Jesus said, uh, you cannot serve two masters. You either love one and release the other and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, you can't hold on to two. You got to make a decision. That's the My bottom Lord. line. You have to make a decision. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me even add more to this. Okay. Now you tell me, Portia, because you're once a part of these guys. At any meeting, did anyone who claimed to be a Christian had an opportunity to recruit souls in the uh the 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 thing that you were in? At any point, they say, okay, we're gonna have uh, Miss Jones today, who is a part of our membership from Delta, whatever. And she's going to come up here and talk about Jesus and to see if anyone is interested in being saved and giving their life to the Lord. Have you ever seen that? No, they ain't talking about Jesus at all. Right. But we had a chaplain that prayed the meetings in. <laughs> Don't worry about that, though. Who he prayed to is a different <laughs> story. Now, here's why I'm telling you that. Here's why I'm telling you that. And that's why this question is so important. Jesus says, anyone that denies me on earth, I will deny him in front of my father. So how are you going to make it? See, you calling yourself Christian, and many Christians do this. Your title Christian, if it's not matching up with what the scriptural rules are as it pertains to a Christian, then all you are is a title carrier. But remember, when God judge us, he's going to judge us from the heart. 
So you cannot say, well, you're holding on to the secret society. You're following their rituals. You're doing all of their, whatever they're doing over there. But yet you're in Sunday church, just like your pastor who's a Freemason, singing Jesus is a deliverer. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you love them. Ha, Jesus, I love you. Ha, that's a performance. Because your heart is committed. You cannot wait for this service to over to put on your regalia to go over here to your fraternity. So you're talking nonsense. So I don't know which heaven. Maybe they have a heaven located at Disneyland somewhere. Maybe you could go to that. But in terms of the heaven where your name has to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're serving another God. There's no way you will be accepted into heaven if you serve Baal, Baphomet, or whatever, and then you say you're serving the Lord God. Uh-uh. So somebody asked a follow-up. They said, so you're saying someone who is saved can lose their salvation. I knew this was going to happen. Go ahead. Because they're in one of these organizations. Listen to me. First of all, you can lose your salvation. In fact, beginning tomorrow, my entire, this month, I'm dealing with salvation, grace, losing it. Anyone that says you cannot lose your salvation clearly does not own a Bible or they do not read it. Okay, mm. let's go. When you accept Jesus Christ, here is what happens. The Bible tells you the requirement to be saved. Now, many people put other frills on it. They talk about the sinner's prayer and all that other stuff. You don't have to do that. You can do it if you want to. But here's what the Bible says. It says that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, I am safe. Mm -hmm. That's what it says, right? Okay, so when I did that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I did that off of my own free will. God didn't force me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if he had, then he would be violating my free will that he gave me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can one lose their salvation? Now, I'm going to be honest with you, it isn't easy to do because people believe that if I became a Christian, let's say I became a Christian today, and tomorrow I go and fornicate, cuss, and lie, did I lose my salvation? No, you're still safe. What if I go and rob a bank? You are still safe. So, Kevin, what is it to lose my salvation? Let's go back to the scripture. Jesus says, whoever denies me on earth, I will deny him before my father. So to lose my salvation means I renounce Jesus. I don't want nothing to do with you anymore. I want to serve Satan. I want to serve these altars. Jesus, I don't want you. So Jesus cannot force me to want him. So that is how you lose your salvation. You lose your salvation just like how you'd renounce the fraternity, you now had this epiphany and say, Jesus doesn't exist anymore. I reject the ideology of the Trinity, of Jesus, God, the Father, the Son. I reject Abraham. I, I don't want to hear but none of that because I want to serve the Egyptian God, Kemet. I want to serve Buddha, whatever. That is what you call losing your salvation. To say that is not so, then what you're saying is that if I accept Jesus Christ, and I don't want nothing to do with Jesus Christ anymore, Jesus will force me to go into heaven. And that is absolute nonsense. Mm. So, But for the people who are in fraternities and sororities, though, because they pledge these fraternities and sororities, do they lose their salvation? You, well, you don't, have, you don't have salvation to begin with because remember you're serving another God. Help us, Lord. You, you, I don't know why people find it so difficult. You're serving another God. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're 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 pledging, you're you're doing the rituals, you're doing all of that to another deity. I just read you. I gave you about three to four scriptures where the Bible reiterates: they sacrificed, they made pledges, Ooh. they did it to the devils. Paul said, "I beg you, I'm telling you, do not drink the cup of the Lord." and the cup of devils. Do not sit at the table of the Lord and sit at the table of devils. I mean, I don't know much clearer the scriptures have to make it. And I don't even know why a person would want to fight when I just want to hold on to my sorority and I still want to come in church and fake. Why don't you, why don't you just how, let me show how serious this is. And I see it right here on my island. Listen to this carefully, Portia. The secret societies, I've seen them, they, they, some pastors are uh, Freemasons here in the Bahamas, even on this island where I live. And the Freemasons will come to their church and uh, come to the pulpit, stand behind the pulpit, do their thing and whatever. Okay, all right. If that's a brotherly thing, then why can't that same pastor who is the pastor of your church, who's also a Freemason, 
Why can't he go to his secret society and preach? Jesus Christ. Let me go over the scripture again. Jesus said, whoever denies me on this earth, I will deny him before my father. So you tell me what you get from that. Would such a person go to heaven? Would such a person lose their salvation? So what about the people who would say, because in Delta, we had prayer breakfasts, we had meetings where there would be prayer, there would be all kind of stuff, you know, and, and plenty of other fraternities and sororities have prayer breakfasts, prayer luncheons or churches. There are even Greek days at some churches, like right. I ain't going to say his name, but you know. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm going to say it, I know. I know. <laughs> I can go back over the scripture again. He says that you cannot mix the cup of the Lord with the cup of devils. Very clear. And, there and there's, no, there's no excuses that we can make. Listen, what the Bible, in, in Matthew 23, uh, Jesus read the riot act on the Pharisees, who were the leaders of the church. They were such hypocrites. Mm. And for those who, even with this question, yeah, please go and read it. And you will see how he was saying to them, here it is, you're telling these people to be righteous, to do this and that. But here you are doing the opposite to what you're telling them. Oh, you hypocrites. And that's what a person is. You are a hypocrite to say that you are a child of God and you've been bought with the blood of Jesus. But you're in a, listen, listen, you're in a secret society. What, what is the secret you're hiding there? And why can't you pre preach Jesus Christ? and his death, burial, and crucifixion in there. Why haven't you tried to lead your sisters and brothers in the fraternity to Jesus? Why is it that they can come into the house of God and do what they want to do, but you cannot go into the secret society as a member and preach the Lord Jesus Christ? Something is terribly wrong with that. Mm. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get off that question because it can go deeper and deeper. Because yeah. some people no, some somebody asked me. I did a live Q and A when I released the book. I did a live Q and A, and somebody asked me, "Well, my they was like, well, my line brother is the one who brought me to Christ because the line brother is the brother in, that come in with you in the fraternity." Mm -hmm. He's like, "My line brother is the one who introduced me to Christ and brought me to Christ. So how is that wrong?" Mm -hmm. But we we don't answer the question. Right. All right? right, we don't answer the question. So um, the next question is, what about honor societies that have Greek letter symbols? Um, I kind of want to answer that one because, um, well, maybe you can answer even further. But from what I know, when I was in the when I was a freshman in college, I had a three point five GPA and they inducted me into Phi Eta Sigma Honor Society. From what I know, the honor societies, even though they have Greek lettering, are not the same as fraternities and sororities because they just give you an award for your high academics and you don't have to go through a process. You don't have to pledge. You don't have to say any vows. You don't have to go through any rituals. You don't have to do any hazing process or nothing like that. So I wouldn't think that was the same, but what would you say? Well, my question would have been, do you have to go, like you said, to the process of pledging? See, no. this is it. When you pledge, when you do covenant, if someone choose to honor you, I mean, okay, fine. But if, if it's a pledging process, that changes everything. Okay, cool. Um, Y'all, we got a lot of questions. And so I'm just going to only take one or two more because we got to wrap this up, okay? Mm -hmm. We even on here. Um, Somebody said, y'all asking about dreams and stuff. Help us, Lord. <laughs> We're going to do dreams, y'all. We're going to do dreams. Somebody said, what if you don't pledge, but you still have monetary spirits? Okay, that that could, that's another topic for another day, yeah, too. Yeah, right, I could. Because I need to do witchcraft and so on. Yeah, okay. That's another one, too. All right, so we're going to uh, move along because it's about that time to move along. Um, but before we go, y'all, I like to play a little bit of Bible trivia. <laughs> I like to play Bible trivia. And so um, I would like to give away one of my books. So y'all get y'all thumbs ready. I'm going to ask y'all some questions. I'm going to ask y'all some questions. Y'all get y'all thumbs ready. Because I need to see the first person with the answer. The first person with the answer is going to be the one who gets the book. So, 
Um, our first Bible trivia question is, who was the disciple that Jesus loved? Who was the disciple that Jesus loved? And I hope y'all don't answer slow because let me tell y'all. Okay, somebody said John. Let me see the first person. Who was the first person? This was the first one that I see. Okay, Candice, email me, contact at PortiaCarter.com. It's also going to be in the description of um, the live on YouTube. Can I ask you a Bible trivia question? Who, me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because I be want, I be wanting to make sure my special guests know the Bible too. <laughs> I mean, we know you know the Bible, okay? So, um, who who were considered the the sons of thunder? Oh, that was uh, two of the disciples. Mm -hmm. That was uh, who was the two? The two was uh, I know, I know the two, <laughs> I know. Uh, I uh, see my mind so set on covenants and altars. <laughs> the two. This is the fun part. The, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, yes. Right. I can't remember their name, but I know it's them. James and John. But right. you got it right. The sons of Zebedee. That's right. who it was. Right. My my light keep going out. It's, that's ghetto. Okay. So um, this one, this one is hard. So let me ask the group. Okay. It's not that hard, but you can probably answer. Who can name all 10 plagues? All I'll, 10 plagues that myself. God did on the Israelites. I mean, not on the Israelites, but on Egypt Egyptians. when he was trying to free the Israelites. Whoever can name all 10 plagues very quickly, and I'm going to give y'all, because I know y'all probably Googling them. I'm going to give y'all <laughs> till, I'm going to give y'all two minutes. Two minutes, I'm going to look and see who got it first, and then I will give y'all what you call it. Okay, but for you, this is my last question for you, though, Mr. Kevin. So while y'all putting in mm -hmm. the uh, 10 plagues, <laughs> dang, somebody got it real quick. <laughs> okay, so Kiki, Kiki got it. Here we are. Okay, well, actually, let me count it. Okay, water turned into blood, frogs, lice, flies. Lice was also gnats. It's the same thing. Okay. Water turned to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, um, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the killing of the first boar. Okay, you want a book too? Make sure you email me, contact at PortiaCarter.com and send me all your information. And my last question is for you, Minister Kevin. Uh, what was the name of Judah's daughter-in-law turned baby mama? <laughs> Judas or Judah? Judah. So Judah had a daughter-in-law turned baby mama. Tamar. Tamar. Yes, Tamar, Tamar, her right. name was Tamar. Tamar. Right. Tamar, right. All right. That was right. amazing. You got that one right. So we in there, okay? We know the Bible. Right. So um, for all of my special guests, can you tell them um, where they can find you or all of the audience? Can you tell them where they can find you, how they can contact you, all of your information? Let them know about your book. Yeah. Prayers that work, all of that. Right. Give them okay, the whole well, thing out. Before I even go there, uh, I ordered your book. And oh. uh, I should, yeah, I should be getting that on uh, Friday because, of course, I live in the Bahamas. So oh, once indeed. I have the Amazon, send it to my address in Miami and then they bring it over on Friday. So I'll have that. I'm, I'm so looking forward to reading it. Oh, and, God bless you. And once I read it, I will promote it for you on my uh, social media sites because it's, it's something that people really, really need to 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 read to understand now aside from that of course folks can uh, uh catch up with me on uh you. youtube youtube under uh pastor kevin l ewing as well as facebook i have like five uh individual pages on facebook my personal page and four of the other ministry pages i'm also on uh twitter i also have my own website which is kevin l ewing.com and that, of course, where I have my uh, newly released book, Prayers That Work. And it is a book that teaches you how to pray because there are many people who do not know how to pray. They just babble and run over the same thing over and over. And in this particular book, what I'm doing is teaching you how to insert prayer, sorry, the word of God 
in your prayers. And the reason for that is very simple. God says that he has placed his word above his name. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one tittle of his word shall pass. His word cannot return unto him void. Uh, Psalms 30 verse 5 says that every word of God is pure and that he's a shield unto those that put their trust. So everything is, the emphasis is the word of God. So what better way to pray than to insert the word of God in your prayers? He said to remind him of his word. He already knows what you're dealing with. So what are you going to retrieve from scripture that correlates with what it is that you're seeking or solution or what have you? That is what he wanted to hear. Remind him of his word. So on my website, on my website, Kevin, uh, so far I have my book in English, Spanish, and hopefully by next week it will be uh, in uh, French. So I'll have on you see on their French softback for all of them, then the Spanish softback and the English softback. I also have the audio and the ebook for all of them. All of them will be on the website and. Uh, Coming very, 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 very soon. I had a lot of people badgering me about it. I decided to go ahead and do it. But a lot of the uh, little slogans and quotes that I make during my videos, such as uh, I'm trying to help you and so on, then we're going to have paraphernalia, like a little store there where people could purchase cups and mugs and writing yes. cards and all this other stuff and uh, coffee mugs and all of that, all of that, the brand more or less with those things. We're going to uh, push that. I also have app, the Android as well as the iPhone. Yes. Again, Kevin L.A. Ewing, you just type that in and it'll pull it up, which you have a uh, dream interpretation, many books that I've recommended, you name it. I got yes, everything yeah. there. So I also have a, a blog site. I, I really would encourage you to go there, kevinlaewing.blogspot.com. And that's where most of my original work began. I used to write back then. Every now and again, I go and clean up some of the bad grammar and punctuation marks and so on because uh, that was written years ago. But it's a lot of truth, spiritual warfare. That's my main thing that I deal with. I deal with the spiritual realm. And again, if you watch my videos, my testimony, you will see how I how I ended up here. And I just thank God that I never thought that what I was going through at the time, the horror, the manifesting of demons in front of me, the oppression, I never thought that it would have mushroomed to where I would literally be ministering literally all over the world. This was never my plan. I never planned to be a preacher, none of this. And all of this came out of what I thought was a horrendous time. But the truth was, just like many of you listening right now, it was God grooming me, chiseling me into what he has called me to be, and then launched me. Those hard times had to humble me and had to bring me to a point of submission to be obedient and to truly know what is the voice of God and the voice of the devil oh, in order to make decisions Lord. going forward. So I thank God for the many lives, the many testimonies that I get. And I listen to people. Right now, my YouTube is at 246,000 subscribers. Again, I never planned this. As you can see, my little... Uh, YouTube little trophy in the back that they sent me. Yeah. Uh, right. So all of those things is a testament and it is fruit. And that's what your life should be producing. Sitting in a church for 6.9 million years and there's no fruit in your life. I think you better reevaluate your salvation. The, the whole idea about Christianity is to produce fruit. You are a new creature now. So new stuff should be coming from you. Don't tell me you were a Christian for 889 years and you're still the same person that you were before becoming a Christian. Something is <laughs> fundamentally wrong there. It is. Ooh. Well, y'all, there you have it. This is Pastor Kevin L.A. Ewing. Um, I met him as Minister Kelly, Kevin L.A. Ewing, so I'll be calling him Minister, <laughs> Minister <laughs> Kevin. Um, he had an upgrade on us, all right? Um, <laughs> get his book. Follow him. For those of you who aren't, I'm pretty sure many of you who are here are following him already. Okay. This is most of his following, I believe, right here. <laughs> so make sure if y'all don't got his app, this app does wonders. I pray this dream prayer almost every day. The prayer for forgotten dreams, canceling and coming to agreement. Pray that every day. I probably read almost every single blog on his blog site, especially when I was having a hard time 
um, figuring out my dreams. Like they really give you insight and details on what certain things mean. So y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, stay locked in with him. Thank y'all so much for joining us today. And Minister Kevin, <laughs> you just don't know how much this means to me. You really don't know how much this means to me. This is a full circle moment for me. I literally thank God for it. I know this would not be without the help of the father. And so may God bless you. Thank you for coming on here and being a blessing to us. Thank you for being a blessing to this world. Thank you for your insight, your teachings. Thank you for studying to show yourself approved and then giving us what you have been studying. You are greatly appreciated and you are loved. Thank you so much. God bless you abundantly. God bless you abundantly. But um, all right, y'all, that's a wrap on Called Out Live. Thank y'all so much for joining me. Um, y'all know we do this every single Tuesday night at um, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, come and join me next week because we're going to have another special guest. And we are diving more into my special guest next week. We are diving more into the deception of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated specifically. Okay, so um, make sure y'all be here next week for that. I appreciate y'all um, and I'll catch y'all. God bless y'all and we out. <laughs> <laughs>